Okay, um, looks like we won't be too many today. Um, and yeah, I only have um, like 20 minutes to say, and then Rüdiger is gonna um, come to the front and is gonna talk about Altea. And yeah, so today's lecture is about interactive visual visualization. And then on Thursday, I want to talk quickly about um, speeding up your program. That means mo using mostly parallel processing or um, uh, just introducing other means of speeding up your Python process because Python is not the fastest language there is. In fact, Python, Python is the slowest language there is, I think. Well, not the slowest, <laughs> but, but the slowest one that's actually used. It's slower than Java, so uh, that means something. <laughs> okay, so interactive visualization. Um, so, so far, we showed you um, a bunch of ways to plot stuff, but uh, this was all non-interactive. And when we had our working uh, notebook, we needed to change code to change our visualization or to change anything because our Jupyter notebook is just a static thing, code and its output. And if we don't change the code and we run this code, we can't change the output. Um, however, Jupyter Lab is really nice and Jupyter notebooks in general because they allow su uh, such things. And then contrast to a script where you actually only can run the script on Jupyter notebook instances, you can have interactive stuff in there, such as sliders or drop down menus or whatever, and uh, interact um, and let the user interact with that and then run code depending on the values um, the user ran here. So, and what is this? This is mostly Jupyter widgets. So the Jupyter widgets are just some notebook extension which you should have in your notebook when you installed it the way we wanted you to install it. And these are basically eventful Python objects um, that have a rent, uh, representation in the browser such that you have something, some way of controlling it, a slider, a text box, a button, anything. And then you can build interactive stuff with these. So you can make basically this notebook you can make from a static document to an interactive dashboard, which is really nice and a really nice way of presenting data because if you want somebody to look at your data, um, it's nice if that person can, for example, look at certain values or look at only specific range of values or whatever, and this is a nice way of representing your data. It's obviously not gonna be uh, possible to print this into a thesis, um, but I think uh, they're like, First of all, it's not only for your thesis. Uh, you're not only coding for your thesis, but you're coding for science in general. And if you want to show something to your supervisor, it's always nice if the supervisor can interact and look at stuff the supervisor actually has interest in. Um, and in general, it's just a nicer way of representing your data. Okay, so uh, like I said, you need um, the Jupyter, um, which you need the extension for this, which is installed in our build. And then um, you need the IPython, uh, IPy widgets package, and from there you can simply import everything you want to import. And this is just the first example to show you what we can do here. So we plot something interactively. So we simply um, we use matplotlib here to create um, some plot, which is basically just a slope and interception. And this function has as arguments the slope and the intercept and then we can make an interactive plot with this. I'm not showing you this in detail, just to show you what you can do with this. So, and then um, we created somehow these two sliders and we let the, um, the function we created be um, reactive upon a change of these sliders. So we can change the values here, which will then change up apparently um, these two arguments of the function and we plot the function with these changed arguments, which is really nice um, if you have interactive data here. Okay, so how do these widgets work? These widgets work. Um, they have basically they have representations. So what's called when you actually call them. So uh, as we know, Jupyter Lab always shows calls the representation function from the last thing in your in your code cell, and that is then the output. And if this is something which has a nice display representation, like our IPython display, uh, like our sliders here, um, this is then something, if we return this, um, my Jupyter instance automatically displays the widget. So here we just create a widgets.insliders. So this is here, this um, IPython widget. And then we see if we simply call it 
And it's the last thing of our cell. Um, so it doesn't even need to be the last thing. So as we see here, now there's no output. Um, and if we call it and uh, evoke the either we have it as the last thing of our cell or we display it actively, um, then it's represented here in Jupyter. So this is just a random slider. So like I said, if it's the last thing of a cell, Jupyter is automatically uh, generated because it generates the output. If it's not, we can always call the display function. That's why I imported it here. So if we create a new widgets.in slider, we can display it and it's here and we can display it again somewhere else and it's here. And we even see um, those two are in sync because we only have this one instance of uh, the in slider. So in the backend, there's only one uh, actual well, value, like the, the object of the slide, the instance of the slider. And only on the front end, we have two representations of these, but they are underlyingly the same, the very same slider and the very same instance. So they have the same value. Um, and then we can simply get the value of the slider calling, well, our slider dot value. Um, but as we see here, if we simply return it, it's not interactive. Um, so it's interactive here, and there is somewhere um, the like somewhere in our kernel, there's the information of the current value of our slider. But because this here is not an interactive cell, but simply well, an executed code, it's not going to be re-evaluated when we change the slider. Um, so we need to rerun the cell to get the new, the current value of the slider in the backend. There are, of course, other ways to get this value and to interact with it. But this is just to show you that um, the interactive stuff needs to be, well, actively interactive, so uh, simply having normal code in here, even if it relies on these widgets, um, needs to be re-evaluated if uh, there are no interactive elements which we call, for example, this function to get the value. Okay, um, so we see here we have the same widget twice. We can link two similar widgets, so imagine we had um, so we have here a float slider and a float text. So these sliders elements, we see them, they are on this stuff where you can drag the value with the mouse. Uh, we can also have this float text element where we can enter a text. So we can have here, I don't know, what's the maximum value of the slider? Is it something like 70? Yeah. No, it's not, it's even higher. So we have these two here and we see they are linked. Uh, so they always represent the same value. So can so we create both of these widgets um, we call the display function to actually display them and then um, we can even link them so we don't so we don't do anything with this link so we uh, have to assign this link to a value if we want to unlink them eventually but if we don't we can simply call widgets dot uh, this JavaScript link and this and then we link the values which is what will represents the number of these of these two elements and now they are linked so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, why do I want to represent it in two different ways? Or what do you mean? I mean, so this is just for interaction with the user. So if you have the case, like this value is not supposed to be just this number, but you're going to use this number to as input for a function or something in the end. And then, for example, you plot something depending on this number or whatever. And then, I don't know, this would be, um, the slider would be um, a WAF, uh, changing the number waffly, so just sliding and trying out different values. For example, I don't know, you want to find the minimum of a function graphically. So you have your plot somewhere, yeah, and then, um, so, I mean, that's a really stupid thing to try to find the minimum of a function man manually, right? But imagine you have this function here, and then you want to, um, you want to know the value at a certain position. So you, you have um, your slider for this x position, and then you have this value here, and then you can move it along, and then you are, this value is much higher, is this maybe, so this is a stupid function because this doesn't have a minimum, so imagine it's like this. And then you move it around and you see eventually, aha, there's a small value here, 
And if you have a slider where you can simply move this Y here, yeah, then you have the, the WAF, then you can move it roughly. And then once you're somewhere in this area, you can use the uh, other representation to find the exact minimum to change like three digits after the, after the uh, comma or something. So this is just something which you can do. It, has, it doesn't have any value. I just wanted to show you that you can link them. Um, because, for example, this is also how we can show our value from before interactively because we can link, for example, this slider and this label. So we have here um, and another widget, which is a label, which we display here. So this is now an interactive output because these widgets.label is something interactive. If I bind this with the value of this slider, um, we see that this interactively changes its value too. So if you need to reuse a number, you can simply create a label where you have it, the, where you use the value of some slider or something, and you can just link them to have different representations of the same thing. Don't always need it. Use cases where you need it are there. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Was this your question? Okay, yeah, so now we only sh saw these widgets here and that we can change a number, but we didn't do anything with it. Um, obviously, that's useless. Um, it becomes useful when we use the interact function because um, what we want to do is we want to have some function where, where we have some argument which we can, can change and actively, and the function does something depending on this argument, right? Such that the user can change values, for example, look at a certain range of values um, and we can decide what the range of, of these values is. Um, so let's create some really, really simple function. Uh, let's create a function that simply returns uh, the square of an input number. So we have our function f and we have simply it returns the square. And then we can pass this function to our interact function. And if we pass this along with an integer keyword argument, it automatically creates a slider for this value. So what we see here um, is the result, the re what this f function returns. Um, and as first input, we want to take this 10. So this is where the slider starts at the 10 position. But um, it automatically created this slider widget such that we can change the value. And if we change this value, um, so it changes so the input of this function. So we have this x is the same argument as the argument in this function, so we can change with our slider what this function gets as input, and then it's going to be called over and over again when we change this value. So as soon as we change this value, um, we call the f function again with a new uh, argument, so with the value of our slider as new argument, and then we return the value of our function here with this argument. Um, and yeah, this function uh, has, whoops. so if we call interact with different data types, we're gonna get generate different widgets. So for example, if we call this with a truth value or not, um, it will automatically create a checkbox. So this here, uh, of course, zero squared is zero and one squared is one. So this returns only zero and one, but if we have some truth value here as argument, it will create generate a checkbox. We can also pass a string. Now, the square of a, string, of a string obviously doesn't make much sense, so we have another function here, just some function that returns whatever is gonna be input, so the easiest function of all, return the input, and if our input for this function here is a text, it will auto automatically generate a text area, and if we change stuff in this text area, we change what this function is gonna return, so we can have text here, and this is gonna be returned by this function. Um, we can pass a list or dictionaries. So in this case, again, we have the simplest function of where we simply return the output, uh, the input again, and then we have, as argument, for example, we have this dictionary which will automatically um, generate this drop-down menu, and I can select one or two. And what we see here, if I have a dictionary, it's uh, the value is going to be well, this the keys are going to be what's in the drop-down menu and the values are going to be what's returned. Um, what's also really nice is that we can not only call the function like this, but we can, like the interact function, with 
the function we want to inter we want to have interactive, yeah, we cannot only call this directly, but we can also use a decorator. So when we have our function, when we create our function here, we can um, have the interact decorator with this at the front, and then um, from like uh, and then this decorator can have arguments again, and then depending on these arguments, we see we have a tooth, uh, a boolean value here, and a float value. So this is going to automatically create um, the checkbox for the boolean and a float slider for this float value. Um, and where my function again is really simple, I simply return my two inputs. So we see the interactive output of this function is simply whatever I put in here. Um, if my function needs other values as arguments, I can simply, but I don't want these uh, values interactively. I don't want them, I don't want the user to be able to change them. I can also simply call fix such that now I don't have the slider because this is supposed to be a fixed value. So if your function needs these arguments anyway, but you don't want the user to change these arguments, you can simply put it around fixed here. So yeah, so, so far, what we did is we passed ins, floats, booleans, strings, lists, and dictionaries. Um, but in fact, these are only abbreviations for the respective widgets. Um, and we saw these widgets here before already. So we have these widgets, widgets.int slider object here. And uh, it will simply automatically create, if I pass an integer, it will automatically make an integer. If I pass a float, it will automatically make a float slider, and so on and so on. And of course, um, I have more control over these sliders, and I can pass oops, I can pass them arguments. For example, the in slider has the arguments mean, marks, step, and value, and more, such that I can well tell where I want to be the, the minimum value is supposed to be negative 10, the maximum value is supposed to be positive 10. I want to change in steps of 1, which is the case here. And my starting value was 10. Uh, so this is another way to do this. And again here. We can have our interact function requires a function as first argument, and we have the simplest one that simply returns the input. And the input value here is supposed to be given by this slider, which we have here at the front again. So yeah, for integer sliders and float sliders, for example, we can also pass a tuple of min max or min max step instead. Um, another nice shortcut here. And yeah. So Another way of representing the initial value is simply having here in our function a, key, a default value. So if we have this function interactively, so if we have the interact decorator here, um, and we have the uh, keyword argument that acts as support, like the default argument of 5.5, our slider is going to be default at 5.5. So this is just a quicker way of representing the same thing as we did here. OK, however, of course, using the explicit variant gives, gives us more control. Um, and these are, uh, I think, all the um, parameters this float slider has. So we see we have the mean, max, and the value, and the step. We had this already. We can give our slider even a description, which is going to be given to the left of the slider. Uh, we could well, disable it. We could turn off uh, continuous updates, which makes sense if we have a slow function. So believe me that this function here is very slow. Yeah, and if I now change the slider, um, nothing's going to happen anyway, because it's going to be really slow to calculate the new value. Now it did. So if I'm still moving it, oops, oh, no, button. So believe me, this function is really slow on my laptop. Oh, wow. So it actually, the fence went up, so it's really um, a bunch to do. So what we could, for example, also do here is setting simply continuous update equals false, such that my laptop doesn't try to um, re-evaluate the function here with all values just when I press, when I release the button. So this makes it much faster if I release the button um, because it doesn't try to generate all the other values in between. Um, for very slow functions, there's also this interact manual function. It's, a, it's the very same arguments as the interact, but it simply automatically generates this button such that I can precisely select the value and then only once I click this button, it's going to start calculating and it's going to return my number here. So yeah, this is um, how we interact with the values. And in fact, there are really, really many um, of these Jupyter widgets. So if you look at the um, user guide of these widgets, we see where we saw already this in slider and the float slider. So these are pretty nice 
um, where we can also display them vertically. Yeah, we have this keyboard argument orientation. Um, we can have a float log slider, which is precise at the lower numbers and coarse at the higher numbers. So we simply, it's a nice way of presenting with a log scale. Um, we can present ranges where we have two output values. Same for floats. We have this nice progress bar, which we are not using for the, right? We're not using this for the countdown. We wanted to use for the countdown. But yeah, so progress bars, like for example for the countdown, same thing for floats. Um, we have this bounded text value where we have some maximum value and we can't enter a higher number. Um, same thing for floats, unbounded ones. We have this toggle button which can be clicked or not. Uh, we have checkboxes. We have this nice Boolean output value of valid. So it's going to simply, for true, it's going to return a green check mark, and for four, it's going to return this red X. Uh, we have these drop downs. We have radio buttons. We have a select box. We have a selection slider where we have some um, well ordered values. Um, we have a selection range slider again. So many, many different items and all kinds of stuff to uh, interact um, with our with our program. So we can even show images, we can show buttons which have some return value and once we click them, we can, we saw this already, so we played already, um, no, we didn't see this already, but we can even play sounds or interactive stuff, date pickers which show us, um, depending on our world, I think this doesn't work on, yeah, this doesn't work on Safari, but um, because this thingy of uh, date selection is not uh, given in, uh, in Safari, but we have this, um, date selection, we can even have a color picker which automatically opens some color value which is really useful if we don't know the color code of anything so we can automatically simply create it here. Uh, this also works, we uh, plugged in a, a joystick and it automatically, like on, at least on Linux, I don't know how good it works on Windows, but it automatically detected the joystick and I could use all the inputs so I, you can in theory scroll with your joystick or your gamepad through your, anima uh, through your interactive plots or something not really necessary, but pretty cool that it's possible and that it works without uh, without any drivers. And yeah, and these are widgets to stack other widgets so we can stack them horizontally, we can stack them vertically. I'm going to show this in a second. Um, we have stuff where we can, for example, this is so-called accordion, we have multiple things. We can have tabs where we can have multiple things, so it represents the same thing here. And so on and so on. I think that was all right. Yeah, so this is the next thing. So we have really many ways of inputting values. And this is just a combination of all of these, for example. So we have here, let's see, what do we have here? Um, so first of all, we created a date picker, which has simply this description, pick a date. Uh, it's, well, it's not disabled, and we can pick a date here. Um, and then, of course, we have, and then we have this accordion. Yeah? And this accordion has two children, namely this in slider and a text. So we see this is an in slider, and this is a text. And yeah, so we set the titles for whatever is in there such that we know what's in there. And then we also have this top thingy and we nested our accordion into, so we nested our accordion and our date picker into the step things. So titles again for that and then we showed the entire thing. So we see here, this is a nested thing. So in this accordion, the first top, uh, so in this top thingy, the first top has this accordion and the second one has this date, tick, date picker and so on. So we can nest widgets as, much as we want, and we can have as many widgets as we want. That's really nice. OK, then I have one. Do you have any exercises in your stuff, Rüdiger? OK, you don't. I have only this one. Uh -huh. So uh, let the following function interact with the select multiple widgets. So what I want in the end, um, I can't show without revealing the solution here, but I want to have the select multiple right. thing. Okay, this screen is completely broken. Holy shit. Like, 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 <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, I hate this countdown. <laughs> No, it's, it's 
uh, change the input and change it back again, it works again. But <coughs> so no, that's on the again. Anybody actually doing this, by the way? Because if not, we can just continue. Uh, I'm getting to it, but then find out if uh, that results in the current screenshot. Oh no, but that can take half an like, oh yeah, I pushed, so, and I didn't start Binder after the push. Okay, this will take at least half an hour because Binder needs to install the dependencies. How about Binder works now? So I'm, uh, I'm like going down, but it might take like five minutes before I get to the actual file. Yeah. Can I then just continue? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Sure, wait five more minutes. I'm just going to continue, I think. Um, so just, well, we know that we want to have this select multiple thingy here, right? Um, and if we don't, we just look at uh, whatever the domain of this here is. It's so this, uh, the documentation of IPython widgets. And then this has the widget list here. And we see that we want this select multiple. And we select multiple as the keyword argument options. And well, as options, we want to have our known foods, which uh, is the list given here before. And then simply, again, we simply call the interact function. First argument is the function. Second argument is um, the values. So it must have the same name as here, so foods. And then we can have this stuff. And if we select multiple things using our control key, we can select all the things. And today, I will eat all the foods. I will eat all the foods. Yay. Okay, um, interact was this one function. Um, there's also the interactive function, which ma simply makes a function interactive. So here we have our function, which actually calls the display function itself. And if we make this here interactive, we see that now, so this is um, a new function of type IPython widgets dot interactive. So we see here um, that our function now is something which um, can be displayed itself because we have this display argument here. And if we do so, it's going to be um, just, it's going to behave like a widget does. And it's going to show, well, our two input widgets, which we um, created um, by passing, the argu by passing um, them as arguments to our interactive function, just like to our interact function. And it's going to represent the output just as well. And now I can display, so I can reuse this all over and over again. And I'm going to have, I'm gonna have um, the same, the very same values um, over and over again. Uh, so we see here, this now is basically simply a combination of other widgets. So in our widget here, in our interactive widget, which we created, we have an insider widget, another insider widget, and this output here. And we simply, when we display it, we simply display all these three things and um, they're going to be linked and interactive. So we see here that, um, and, in Kirk, and then what we can also do is we can look at our keyword arguments, our inputs, and we can look at our result of this function here. Um, of course, if I have it like this, this is not interactive, and I need to rerun this code cell um, because, well, these are, um, this is not re-evaluated um, except when I run this cell. Okay. Uh, as much for these, all these input stuff and so on. So how can we actually use it? Let's look at an example. So we saw already before our Titanic data set, this is nothing new. We had this already in uh, five lectures ago or something. So this is just, um, this plots the distribution of males and females in a, uh, in a bar plot. And what we can do now is, well, we can make this interactive by ma simply making a function out of this. Um, and for example, now I want to only uh, represent the uh, gender distribution uh, in a certain age range. So what I can do is I can make, um, I can make this here 
can simply put it into a function. So this here does the very same thing as before, except that I now want to have as argument a date, a date range, and I want to get only uh, the values that are between this range. So this now accepts, this function accepts as first argument a data set, which is going to be of the 10 data set, of course. And the second argument is going to accept a lower bound and an upper bound, and it's simply going to display, it's going to um, plot only the values, uh, the, uh, the sex distribution between this upper and this lower bound. And then I can simply again call my interactive function with this function and the keyword arguments here. I don't want to be able to change the data set, right? Because well, I only want to do it for, like, it doesn't make any sense to have, interact to have interactive stuff before a data set because this is supposed to be about the data set, set the Titanic data set, so it's fixed. Um, but for the age range, I can make my nice float range slider here, which takes um, the, well, which has its minimum value where the actual minimum age and its maximum value the maximum age. If I now do this, I'm going to have this slider together with my plot. And if I change values of my slider, this function here is going re, to be re-evaluated, which means the plot is going to be re-plotted, and I can plot um, the distribution here by this age slider. So we can, for example, find, so there were as many te in teens, the male-female distribution is almost equal, but overall there were far more males than females here. So this is something, so here and from 60 something on, there were only males anymore, so an elderly people are only males. So this is just a nice way of having interactive data, right? So we have our data set here, we can change some values, we can look at it, and I mean, I don't know if this is useful for your data exploration, but you can think of many, many useful um, things when exploring your data where you have interactive stuff. Um, we can use interactivity in all steps of the data analysis process. So for example, the very first step, if we want to simply look, if we want to simply describe the columns, what we can do here is where we have our describe function here, which we want to have interactively, and we want to be able to select the column here. Um, I simply provide the list of all columns of my data set. And then from these column, which I'm going to return here, I'm just going to want to, I just want to describe whatever, um, whatever column I have here. And because I provide a list here, like I said before, I am um, automatically going to generate, generate this um, um, select menu. And then I can simply select something, and it's going to describe um, this very column. So. It's a nice way of being able to explore your data set really, really quickly by just having this three-liner. Really nice, really easy. Another thing which we had already before, we had this, um, what was this even, even? What was this data set? Some kind of stock data set. Yeah, some kind of stock data set. So this is what we already called before, right? We have, this is just a huge data set now. Um, with a date index and some value. And if we plot this, it looks like this. And I can also create a function that plots only between two dates. So I'm gonna, um, so this function then needs a start date and an end date. I'm gonna make pandas timestamps out of this. And I'm gonna take only these values of my data set, uh, which are in between the start date and my end date. I'm going to print how many values there are, and then I'm simply going to plot it. And now I can call my interact or my interactive function with this function, and as the possible values of start date and end date, well, I want to have a date ticker, a date picker here, and the um, standard value for my date is going to be, for my start date is going to be the, well, the lowest date, and for my end date is going to be the highest date. So this here contains certainly all values, uh, but I have this nice interactive date picker, and I can start later. Now we see there's a value less, and if I uh, increase the year here, I'm going to... I'm eventually going to be... Uh, I'm, have, I'm having less and less values, so there are only 300-something values here. And now I can, for example, also go for only one year, and because Pandas is so nice, it's going to even change my presentation here, so now we see that we only have, so that Pandas automatically knows, well, I only have uh, six months of data here, so I'm gonna not show the uh, year number here, but the month, because this is a date time index. 
So yeah, really nice if you want to, this is also a really nice feature if you just have something, I don't know, this is a perfect example, looking at stock data, right? In stock data, you sometimes want to look at the, um, at the uh, history of your plot for a span of like five years, and sometimes you want to look at the history of your plot in a span of five hours. So this is a nice way of being able um, to interactively do that without having to change your code all the time. Yeah, um, that's almost it. Now I'm just going to show you that you can uh, also display text and more and have nice formatting in your Jupyter um, notebook or in your Jupyter um, lab here by using the output widget. So imagine we create this output widget here. So this is simply a widgets.output. And then as the layer argument, I can even provide um, a cascading style sheet syntax uh, to make, well, to format my output here. In this case, I simply make a one pixel um, solid black border around my text. So now I'm going to dis uh, I'm, I'm representing it here, I'm displaying it here. And what do I see? Well, nothing, because I don't have any text in there. So this is two pixels wide, because, well, it's the upper and the lower bound, but there's no text in between. But what's really nice is we can use now our context manager to print text to this function. So when I'm writing this width and then my output widget, and whatever I'm printing inside here, it's going to be printed inside my output widget here. So I can add more and more stuff interactively into this very cell. Um, and I can have this, uh, I can show the content of my output widget in a bunch of different positions at, uh, in my notebook. So, and then I can have another context manager and add more stuff to my output widget here. So for example, I can, well, I'm simply adding one more line here. And what I'm also doing, I'm displaying this iframe in here. You already saw this, you already saw this a couple of times in our lecture where we included stuff from other websites. This is simply an, an iframe, which is also a Jupyter widget. So we can simply display this Jupyter widget of the iframe to my output here. And it's going to be uh, added there. And then I can add it again and again and again. And eventually, my output is going to be really long um, and really convoluted. And yeah, I'm going to can see it again here, and all my stuff is in here. Uh, I can, of course, only delete it. And now if I clear the output, it's going to clear the output. Oh, God, I'm just caught up. So now all my outs here are empty, as we see. So we can also uh, use, for example, decorators for functions. So everything which this function here prints and all the exception this raises are going to be captured to this out. So it's not going to be printed below this cell, but in this output here. Uh, we can use the append standard out function. So there are a bunch of ways to add stuff here. And like I said, so this is just a container of where all your stuff is going to get. And if we have more complex widgets, they basically work the same way as here. So imagine now we have this interactive, so uh, we have this interactive output widget here, um, which simply is going to display where the value of this, the value, so the value of the first slider, the value of the second slider, the third, and my output here. And if I want to display all of these things, so I have my three sliders and my output, which is some nicely generated text um, generated by this function here, I can simply well, stack them all into a widget, for, into a, a horizontal box. So first of all, I'm making these three here in a horizontal box, which creates a new widget, uh, no, in a vertical box, I mean, which creates a new widget, and then this new widget of these three sliders and my interactive output here, I'm going to put in the horizontal box and I have all my stuff inside one widget. So I can have uh, W equals this here, and then I can display my W, uh, and I'm going to have all my stuff here, and I can display it again and again. Yeah, and also I can nicely render uh, Markdown HTML using this. So for this, we need the Markdown package, um, which we need to pip install first. Um, I added it to the requirements now. It wasn't there before. But with this, for example, so first of all, this Markdown package simply makes HTML for Markdown. I can add my own HTML here. And if I print this now, well, we see that the Markdown package, what it simply did is it well, made HTML text out of Markdown text. And I can show it here. And if I call the HTML function, we also did this a couple of times in um, our lecture slides, it nicely renders my text here. So I can even render text um, in my Jupyter notebook. And then I could simply export the content of this cell once I made a 
nicely formatted cell using all my output widgets and nicely formatted marked on HTML. And I can even create exportable stuff here in my Jupyter Lab instance. Yes, just as much, for example, I can show images. So this is just, um, um, so this first of all shows the text to show you what's going on here. So we have simply um, os.list here represent, um, returns a list. So we have a list of all the file names in this directory. This is from uh, two weeks, one week ago. There's two, there are two figures in this very, um, in this directory and I can select them and if simply if I print the path, I'm gonna print the path. Um, but I can also display whatever the content of this here is as an image. And if I do so, I can select the image and display the image just like this. Really nice, there are many, many ways of displaying stuff inside Python, inside Jupyter um, using the widgets. Okay, uh, what else can I do? I can bind callback functions to interactive elements. So for example, I'm, I'm creating the button here and I'm displaying it. I'm having this function uh, which simply prints button clicked and I can add this as a callback function once the button is clicked. So now if I click the button, I'm gonna execute this function here. So if I click it, nothing's gonna happen. Why is nothing happening? Well, because this printing is nothing interactive and I need to do something interactive. So what, what I can do instead I can create something interactive, like my output widget here, and then on simply I change this on button click function to something that prints something to my interactive widget. I need something interactive to represent it on the button. And then I'm removing the first callback because this didn't make any sense anyway. I'm adding another callback, and if I now display the button again, I'm gonna add something to my interactive output widget here, which is really nice. Okay, and using this, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can add all interactivity you want to your code and have it all nicely. Okay, and then there's one last thing I want to show you because we didn't look at Plotly. I'm just gonna show you that Plotly uh, nicely combines with the Jupyter widgets. So I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm just gonna show how it may look because this Plotly gives the iplot um, method to pandas datasets, which can then be called using a bunch of different, um, so if we have a list, so again, this is, we have this, uh, the keyword arguments are basically the almost same way as we had um, for interact function. So this is an interactive plot now using the plotly package and I can, for example, change, um, so I'm always plotting against the survived columns. So this is the column of the data set I want to use. And this here is a variable, so I can have um, something. So this here is a list, as we see here, of all the possible columns besides the survived one, because it doesn't make any sense to plot survived against survived. And so I can select this input. I can um, select the theme, because theme here is also a list, so it's also automatically gonna generate um, this picker object, the same for color scale, and the same for kind because we provided explicitly a list here. And using this, for example, I can plot, I don't know, the fare against um, the amount of people that survived. So, well, more people of the lower fare survived, well, because there were more people that paid less money, of course. Um, age, so we see how many of each, um, of each uh, uh, age group survived. So again, this plot doesn't make too much sense because we don't know how many of each age group there were actually on the ship. Um, but we see that we can nicely select here and we can have interactivity in my plot here automatically by having this I plot. And I can even change the theme. If I want to just look at the different themes that um, Pandas is gonna be able to show. I can select them here, it's gonna do them all. I can select the color scales from my list. Um, and well, I can make this bar also horizontal. I also added this hex bin thing to just show you how uh, that it will throw an exception. <laughs> but if I change back, it's gonna reevaluate the function and the exception is gonna be even done. So yeah, so this here, as we see, is the same thing. So let me go back to my H here. So we see that this is a really bad color scale because I can't see anything. Uh, so what do we see here from, uh, 
the age group of, what is this, 20? Yes, something is really, really imprecise here. So we see from the age group of 24.5, yeah, thank you. So we see from the age group of 20, there must be around three people that survived. So let's look at it manually here using our slider. So the age group of 20, there were three people that survived, that's two. So we simply return, we simply print the, um, uh, the sum of the people that survived here. And we have input our select here. And we see that this actually corresponds to the very same symptoms. So there was one 80 year old survivor. Yeah, um, yeah this is, use, this uses Plotly, which we don't show just as a teaser that this is nicely possible and interacts nicely with the Jupyter widgets. However, what we're going to show you now is interactive visualizations with Altea. So we're really going to talk far too long again. Um, who expected this? Uh, but yeah, now Rüdiger is going to talk about Altea and the Vega Light language for graphics. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Altair now. So what is Altair? Altair is uh, comparable to ggplot or maybe even seaborn in the kind that it's also a grammar of graphics package. So uh, it's, yeah, it's designed for creating visualization in, in a declarative fashion. And you might ask now that we already saw all those uh, grammar of graphics packages, why do we need another one? And the reason is that uh, Altair adds uh, support for interactions in those plots. So you cannot only create visualizations declaratively, but you can also add interactions to those plots declaratively. And that is a very powerful way. So, um, and also what is nice about it that it's relatively new. So um, it doesn't have these uh, legacy problems such as ggplot or plot9 that was ported from R and looks a bit strange. So this is really like a, a Pythonic package, I would say. And the, uh, the way that Altair works is that it uh, is based on Vega Lite. So Vega Lite is the underlying grammar, actually. And the grammar is just specified in JSON. So you might know JSON is like JavaScript object notation. So basically just a bunch of dictionaries as strings. And so there you can describe your plots in JSON. And then this Vega Lite grammar is, uh, uh, goes through a compiler and is compiled down to Vega, which is a, like a more verbose representation of this grammar. And then this is rendered by some JavaScript. Um, and what Altair now adds to this is that we can create these JSON specifications without having to touch any JSON, but that we can directly create them from uh, data that we have in Python and that we have in our data frames. So let's get started. To demonstrate uh, Altair, we're going to use the CAS package, uh, the CAS data set again that we also used in the ggplot lecture, so you should be already familiar with this. Basically, it just contains features about different cars that were produced in the 70s and 80s. And yeah, so to get started, we import Altair and we abbreviate it as LT, so it has some resemblance to PLT, so it already feels familiar. And then we have to create our first chart. So how does an Altair grammar look? So a basic unit chart in Altair contains the uh, the following four uh, building blocks. So you will have data, you will have a mark type, you will have transforms, and you will have an encoding. So you, while usually the transform can be omitted because most of the time you just display our data as it is and do not want to transform it. So this will just default to the identity. So and then how does this look in Python? So what we do is we start by uh, creating a chart instance by instantiating the alter chart class and pass the data there. So we bind the data to the chart, and then we next up we have to specify a mark type, and this in Altair is done using method chaining. So instead of like uh, an overridden plus operator as in ggplot, you now have like a, an object that you start off with, and then you start calling methods on this object, and this these method will always return the object, so you can just continue calling methods on it, and thus build up your specification. So then you call mark.tick. Uh, on those in this chart object, so to this represents a mark type, and this type uh, in this case will be ticks. And then you call the encode function, and this is like the place where you bind now uh, the visual properties to the variables in your data set. 
So in this case, we say x uh, set to horsepower, just as keyword arguments, and we we'll just look at the plot that results from this. So we see that we get an x axis with labels, uh, axis labels, tick labels, and we get those like ticks, so to say. So in this plot is now generated from this specification here. And maybe to demonstrate this once, um, no, this doesn't show the full <laughs> thing anyway. Okay, then uh, for comparison, we will now compare this syntax to the ggplot syntax, so to uh, show you something that you are familiar with, and then you should see that actually the two grammars, at this point at least, map pretty well on each other. So if you would comp uh, try to create the same chart in ggplot, which we also did in the lecture to introduce it, this was look like this. Um, so you start by writing ggplot, then you pass the data, you pass the mapping, all the encoding, and then you add this geometry object. And then you get basically the same plot. So comparing these two specifications, we see that they map on each other. So you could say like chart corresponds to call to ggplot, where you pass the data, and where you also, so to say, start, or which marks the beginning of our sentence in our grammar. So we have to say at some point, okay, here we want to make a new specification, so we need to have some object to start our specification with. Then the encode corresponds to the A's, so to the aesthetics, uh, just that yeah, here we have it as a method call and here we have it as a separate function call that we pass in ggplot, but uh, the syntax is really the same at this point. And then we have these mark types that correspond to the geoms that we have in ggplot. So instead of a geom, this and that, uh, you would have a mark, this and that, and this determines what kind of visual representation your points will actually get in the end. Okay, so um, as this is a, like a grammar of graphics, we, as we would expect, we can just continue to add other encoding, uh, other encodings here, and the plot would update as we uh, would expect it to do. So if we now put the weight on the, on the Y position, we will now get a scatter plot. So we also change the mark type here to points, so we get those points instead of uh, ticks and adding just another uh, variable to another channel as they are called in Altair, so color and y and x position would be channels and then also we get uh, now colored points that are colored by the origin and we also get an automatically generated legend here for the origin. So just a quick word about the data types that you can use in Altair. So Altair would understand four different variable types, so either nominal, ordinal, quantitative, or temporal data. So and I think we already discussed this in the lecture on uh, analysis in Pandas, so the different scales of measurement that you could have. So Altair also supports those, and by default it will always try to intelligently infer what kind of scale you have in your database and your data frame. So if you have just a float a column, it will use a quantitative. If you have timestamps, it will use temporal. And if you have a category, it will use either nominal or ordinal based on whether it's ordered or not. And then it will appropriately produce the scales in the plot that are best for this kind of data type or scale of measurement. However, there might be times where we explicitly want to use something else than the scale that is inferred uh, automatically or where at the specification time the scale is not yet known. And we will see later where this might be the case. However, there then we have two possibilities. So either we can suffix all our variables with a colon and then the first letter of this uh, data type. So making this explicit, we would say horsepower is a quantitative variable, weight is also a quantitative variable, and origin is a nominal variable because the different origins are not really ordered, they're just different countries, and this would result in the exactly the same plot. Now what we could also do if we would say, okay, origin should be interpreted as an ordinal variable, then we would see that we now get a different color scale that has, so to say, has an order in it. And for this kind of data, this doesn't make any sense, but this would be possible. And what we could also do is we could say we want to interpret horsepower as an ordinal variable, and this would also result in a different plot where now each value of uh, that is present in the data gets its own uh, axis label and its own scale, and the plot is a lot longer. So, and for looking at a plot uh, in like more widespread, this might be already useful to uh, try this out once, but 
in general, this would not be the appropriate data type to use here. Yeah, and the more verbose version of this would be to use explicit classes to represent the visual channels. So for every channel that you can map on, so X, Y, and color, and what else there is, there's also, there's always a corresponding ALT dot, and then X, Y, and color or something. And to these channel classes, you first pass a field or the variable that you want to map on, and then you can also pass a type argument where you would write out what kind of type this is as a full string. Okay, then you can also do transformations in your chart specification directly, so because Altair is embedded in Python, it is not so needed so often because you can do arbitrary transformation just like in your Python code, but sometimes it is useful or like more convenient and sometimes it's even necessary to produce certain charts to make the transformation part of the specification. So a common transformation would be for example aggregation, where we would say we want to plot the mean uh, of a variable instead of just the data points. So what we do here, we now first exchange the mark type to a line instead of points. And then here for y, we wrap our variable in a, a mean function, so to say. And this is now the string syntax that is then interpreted by Altair and is uh, rendered down to a specification that says, okay, in JavaScript, now the mean will be computed. So for each point now, we get, we aggregate all the points that are there and compute the mean and display this instead. And another aggregation would be the count, where we would say, okay, I want to use a count, we just write count here. And then for, and we also use the bar mark now, and now for each point we get the number of cars that correspond to this particular value of horsepower. And in the case of count, where the variable mapping or like uh, the variable that is to be transformed is unambiguous, we can also omit passing the variable here explicitly and can just write count like this and this results in the same chart then. Now we are very close to making a histogram, what we would like to do and for this the only thing left to do is we have to bin our x variable and for this there's no way to now, there's no mark histogram or so because the approach with uh, Altair or Vega Lite is a bit more low level than what we know from ggplot, so you can build very uh, customized plots, but uh, usually you have to use lower level primitives. So in this case, we explicitly have to say that we want to bin the x variable now, so we do something like alt.x again, and here we have the customization parameter bin set to true. And this will just produce a histogram that we, as we would, yeah, that we are used to, so this now puts the x variables in bin and now maps the count here of those bins. And because it is a bit more low level, it gives us more flexibility. So for example, what we can do, we can bin two variables, uh, horsepower and weight in this case, and then map uh, the size to count. And this produces like a two-dimensional histogram where now each point uh, represents the number of uh, cars that have these combined values for weight uh, and horsepower fall in these bin of these combined values. So once you have mastered this like a bit more lower level grammar, you can do very interesting visualizations. Yeah, there are also other useful transformation that we don't go into here, but you can look at the user guide, which is also very nicely written and has a lot of examples. So that's a good place to start when you want to do more with Altair. So then there are there's one thing or like two things that make Altair or Vega Light in general special. And one thing is the its way of combining higher uh, way of combining compound figures out of uh, simple figures. So you might remember from ggplot, uh, it is by default a layered grammar, so you can just add things on top of each other and they will be all placed in the same plot. And then you have like some uh, operator like faceting uh, that provides uh, that is that enables you to, to create facet plots uh, based on what kind of variables you have in your data set. So if you have a categorical variable, you can create a plot that contains a subset of the data for each uh, of those subgroups. But in general, there's no other way to combine different ggplots uh, together. And the in Altair, that is different. Um, there you have really lower level operators um, to combine single plots. So there are like lower level operators for layering and then vertical and horizontal concatenation. And there are also higher level operators for faceting and repetition of charts, which make your life a bit easier. 
uh, though they are in theory not really needed. So basically you can do everything just using layering and c uh, concatenation, but of course these, very, uh, these operators make it a bit more nice. So first let's look at layering. What is that? That is what we are used to from ggplot. We make two different plots and then we add them on top of each other. So what we do here is we plot horsepower against weight and then we make a second chart where we plot horsepower against the mean of weight. And then we add those ch two charts together here using the algorithm plus operator. And then we have both visualizations in the same plot on top of each other. Yeah, this is a bit more verbose in contrast to ggplot because we have to repeat this uh, way that we want to use a chart, that we want to use a cast data. And what we can do to make this a bit more easy is to factor out these commonalities into a separate object. So we could make a base object where we say, yes, we want to use a chart, we want to use cars as data, and we want to use, uh, we want to map x to the horsepower, and then we make our chart based on this just by calling, by setting the mark and the y encoding and the line and the y encoding for the other chart, and then we add those together. So we save uh, our, ourselves a bit of repetition in this case. So then for concatenation, what we have here is we make two histograms, one for horsepower and one for weight, and then we want to concatenate them side by side, so vertically. And very intuitively, we use this uh, pipe operator here, or which is like a logical or, so to say. And uh, now the two histograms are displayed side by side. And similarly, we can do horizontal concatenation by using the ampeth end, so the logical end operator or the bitwise end, and this will put charts on top of each other or like yeah, concatenate them uh, horizontally. And now what is nice is that this uh, is very composable, so you can create arbitrary kinds of uh, charts using uh, more and more of those operators. So what we do here is we have a new, make a new scatter plot again, now of horsepower against weight. And we make this a bit bigger by setting the width here as an argument to the chart. And then we first concatenate the two histograms and then we put the, the scatter plot below. And this is totally possible and no problem at all. So, and you could just go on like this and add more and more complex plots to the side and to the top and layer things on top of each other. And this is very nice for creating like dashboards. So then there's a repeat operator, and this allows us to reuse chart specifications for a set of variables. So let's assume we want to make a histogram, but we want to look at the histogram for four different variables. So what we could do now is we could make a partial chart specification and then s call on each encode uh, for the x variable or so. However, what we can also do is we just uh, make our specification like this, where we say x should not be mapped to a specific variable, but it should be mapped to alt repeat column. And here we have to pass the type explicitly because at this point, uh, Altair cannot know what kind of type this variable will have. And then we also say we want to bin it, and after making this partial specification, we call the repeat operator on it, and there we pass the column argument where we pass a list of variables that we want to repeat over. What this will do, or what this does, is it creates, uh, so to say, it iterates over these values here and puts each one in place uh, once, and then we get four different histograms and one for each variable here. So that is a very easy way to reuse then this specification. And yeah, what we can also do with this is we can repeat not only over rows but also over columns. So we could say both for x and y repeat, and then we have two different sets of uh, variables that we want to repeat, one for row and one for column. And this will create a scatter plot matrix because this will now iterate over the product of these two variables and create a plot for each combination. So and here again we see that the Vega light grammar is very low level, but also very composable, and that we don't really need extra primitives for creating scatter plot matrices. We can just like get this out of the of the basic grammar. Yeah, and because uh, another mm, uh, 
gonna show this once here. Um, another argument for why this compositionality is so cool, okay, um, is that we can just, we can combine uh, plots in arbitrary ways using these concatenations and then we can still again treat this just as a single uh, specification. So what we do here is we make two histograms and a scatter plot and stack them on each other, so basically what we saw here already. And then we can, it doesn't matter that this compound, so this is a ch compound chart or a unit chart, we can still just call repeat on it and repeat this plot that consists out of three different plots over these uh, set of variables. And this will now uh, create, so to say, a matrix for these kind of plots. So we have here horsepower against acceleration. So this is going to be horsepower against acceleration and the scatter plot. This will be weight against acceleration. And then here we have the plots for weight and displacement and for horsepower and displacement. So and this is just supposed to show that it's very composable and that you can do whatever you want. No, not really that, but <coughs> yeah, you can really treat uh, compound charts the same way as you treat unit charts and the grammar still works. And there's also faceting operations. So by calling just facet and setting column to a categorical variable, this will create the facet charts that we are used to. So this is also possible and still as useful as it used to be in other libraries. <coughs> okay, so now we finally come to the interactive part. This, this lecture is supposed to be about interactions and not just about Altair. So really the, like the greatest innovation in Altair is that it adds these elements for creating interactive graphics. And we will now uh, use the taxonomy of visual interactions that was like comes from a paper by Yi et al where they try to categorize uh, different interactions that you can have in a graphical system. And we will see uh, what those categories are and how why they are useful and how we can uh, instantiate them using Altair. So each category has a name and then like some uh, short abstract or like some that shows to tries to describe what it's supposed to mean. So the first one would be explore, show me something else. So in this case, what we could uh, do is, uh, so what would explore mean is would just give us the ability to move around in our data set and look at points that we didn't look at before. And the simplest way to do this in Altair is by making a chart specification that as normal and then just calling dot interactive on the chart. And this will enable both zooming and panning on the chart. So we can now just zoom in on the chart and zoom out. And by clicking the mouse, we can also move around the data. And this would now allow us to explore different parts of the data set. So we can go down here, go down here and see, OK, here are only cars from Japan and Europe. And we could go up here and see, OK, here are only cars from the US and so on and so on. Then the next interaction technique would be select, mark something as interesting. So as you can imagine uh, what select is, it means that you click on something and then you select or you highlight this point. And this kind of interaction is useful in combination with something like Explore, where you would say, OK, I see this data set, and now I'm interested in this point particularly, and then I zoom in more closely on this point. But you can first highlight things, and then you can still move on it, uh, move or look, in it, look on it in more detail. And the way we do this in Altair is by making an explicit selection object first by calling alt.selection single here, which means that we want to have a selection interaction that is enables us to select a single point. And then we saw that when we, want, when we click on something, then the color stays as it used to be, but all other points become gray. And the way we achieve this is by using alt condition, so by mapping the color channel not to a specific variable but to alt condition here. And this is like an if then else statement. So first we have so to say the if condition, then we have the then clause and then we have the else clause. So this basically says if the selection is active or if the point is actively selected, then use the origin variable to color the point and otherwise use a constant of light gray here. And then finally, we just have to add the selection to the properties of the chart so that it's connected to the chart. And then this works. 
Okay, then another interaction technique would be extract, elaborate, or show me some, show me more or less detail. So this is, I think, a very useful technique, and we will again first look at the result and then explain how we achieve this in Altair. So this is where you would have an overview and a detail chart, and then you would put them side by side, and then you can select points in the overview and view them in more detail, uh, yeah, in the detail view. And here we enable a so-called brushing selection where we can create like an interval selection. And then only these points are highlighted. And then on the right, we see only this part that is uh, cut here from the plot in like full size. So we see this in much more detail. And we also see that we have a tooltip enabled here when we hover over the points, we see the names of the cars that we have here. So on the interaction this is supposed to enable is then you say, okay, I'm interested in this part down here and I want to know what are those cars that have this high horsepower and low gas, this, this miles, miles per gallon. And we see, okay, here we have only red cars, so only cars from the US. And we have here a Dodge, a Mercury, Chrysler, Plymouth, whatever this is. However, so we could directly think about hypotheses and saying, okay, we know probably here are only cars from the US. I mean, only s we already saw the see this from this plot, but we can think about the hypothesis that this is like a special brand of cars. And by looking at these uh, labels here, we see that this is really a mixture of different brands and this apparently does not really influence this high horsepower, low, low mileage combination. So how do we make this chart? For this, we have to make uh, two different uh, selections. So and in this case, we have to make interval selections. So we use selection interval, and then we set the encoding to X and Y respectively. And this allows us to then both, so this is, would be the selection on the Y, and this would be the selection on the X. And then we make an overview chart, and here we set the condition, so this is just as usual. And then we set the condition to selection Y and uh, selection X, so we say, only if a point is both in the uh, selection of X and Y, only then highlight is highlight it using the origin color, otherwise use light gray. Then we add the two selections to the plot, and so we're done with the overview. And then for the detail, we have to use the trick here, and we, because what we say is we always have the color, but we want to really change the, the scales of the X and Y axis based on the selection. For this, we have to set, uh, we have to use these channel classes again. So we use alt x and alt y, and there we pass a scale argument. And we say uh, the scale, sh the domain of the scale should be based on the selection on x or on the selection on y, respectively. And here we have to use the ref method. So we pass a reference to the selection to this domain, and then Altair will resolve this to what is actually selected at the point, uh, at this point in time. And then here we also introduce this tooltip channel. So to say what we can simply do is say tooltip equals a variable from our data set. So in this case, it's name. And by default, then if we hover over it, then Altair will just display um, uh, the variable for this particular point. And then we just concatenate them vertically. And yeah, we get this very nice interaction. Uh, then the next interaction would be connect show me related items. So this can have two different uh, ways in which, which you could think of. So the first would be to, to show related items or to show re identical items across different views. So here we have our scatter plot matrix again, only that we now have uh, also color added to it. And what we have enabled here is now if we select points in one of those views, then the corresponding points will be selected in all the other uh, scatter uh, in all the other views as well. So, and I think this is actually very useful when you have high-dimensional data where you have like a lot of variables and like cannot look at all of them um, in one plot, at least not without resorting to like uh, mappings that are not as uh, discriminative as positions. So, I mean, you can map to things to color. Uh, values and then to size and then to shape, but at some point it's really hard to discriminate for us and the plots gets also a bit like, uh, 
like just too much in the plot to really see something. But this really enables us now to move around and see, okay, in those other charts, where do the corresponding points lie? And if I change something here, if I move in this force versus accel horsepower versus acceleration space, how does uh, how does this change uh, the points in the weight versus the displacement change uh, space, so to say? So we can see if we move down here, that we move up uh, here. So there's probably a relationship. However, if we are here, then we move. If we move up here, we move down here. However, that's a bit more scattered, and so on and so on. So that is nice. And the way we achieve this is again by making an interval selection. And this type, uh, this in this case, we don't have to bind it to any encoding. We just use it as it is, and then it will just give us this uh, window that we can uh, create. And then we make our specification by uh, using again repeat. And then for the color, we just use this condition syntax using the brush here. And the rest is just as it was before, only that we also have to add the selection here. Yeah. So and then the other um, use case for this connect category would be to show uh, related points in the same plot. So. What we could think of is we have now the scatter plot colored uh, by the different groups, but we have to admit that here the plot suffers from overplotting, so we cannot really see what's going on. So what we have added here is that now if you click a single point, we will highlight uh, only the points that belong to the same origin, but uh, gray out all the other points that belong to different origins. And this would, I mean, for these three categories, it's. Uh, it's already useful, but let's imagine that you have like a plot where you have like 10 different categories and then really changing what categories to display and being able to switch from a uh, like all against all to a one against the rest plot, I think it's very useful to discriminate what uh, kind of uh, variations you have in a single category compared against the other categories. So, and here we can see that the Japan cars are really at the top here, that the US cars are more down here, and we now see the Europe cars are scattered around here. Yeah, and the way we do this is by, again, we have a single selection here, and here we have to pass the argument fields. So fields then, it yeah, just says that uh, if you select a single point, you do not just want to select this point, but you want to select uh, all the other points that have the same value for the field, so and have the same condition. And then again, we have our color condition here. And what we could also do, um, here we could use, instead of select single, we could use uh, select multi, which would allow us to uh, select different categories at once. So if we now press the shift key and then click on another uh, point from a different group, then these two groups would be highlighted. And again, for three, it's not that critical, but if you really have 10, you could enable like all possible comparison, like uh, two against the rest or this against this in a single plot instead of having to make a plot for each possible comparison. And then the final category, category of interactions is filter, and I think this is also the most powerful. Show me something conditionally. And the idea is here to yeah, select subgroups of your data and then to display them in a new context based on the filtering condition. So, and the canonical example for this is the following. We have our scatter plot again and we have a histogram uh, at the bottom. Or not, not really a histogram, rather just a bar plot. So we have the number of uh, cars from this respective origin. So what we can do now, we have a brushing selection enabled and when we move over the points, we will recalculate this histogram based only on the points that match the current selection. And this really enables us to see trends in our data that we also could have seen before, but we could now we can see them much more, much better and much more precisely. So we can see that really in the top here, we have a mixture of different origins, but Japan is dominating. And it, once we move down here, then US starts to take over. And when we go down here, then really only US cars are left at some point. So uh, this kind of trend we could have already seen in our scatter plot here, but I think by looking at a window like this, we can really see the relations much more, uh, yeah, much better because we now really have these uh, this position feature where we can, uh, that is much better discriminable than just looking at color distributions here. Yeah, and the way we enable this is 
by making first a points plot where we have just this condition here. And then on the bars plot, which is now where the new interesting thing is, we make a chart with a bar mark and then we encode the stuff as usual uh, using the count here. And then we apply the function or the method filter, uh, transform filter. So on this, where we simply have to pass a selection and this will directly filter uh, all, all filter out all the points that do not match the selection. And then we just concatenate the two views. Yeah, and you could also think about this in an even simpler setting where you just have like a one-dimensional point plot and then you can just uh, make a window here and you can just move along this variable and see how the distribution of uh, yeah, this categorical variable, this origin variable changes as you move along here. Okay, then a final word on exporting plots. Uh, so what you can do with Altair, because it's based in JavaScript, you can export things to the web very easily. Um, so I don't know. So what you can just do, you have your specification, and then you call save dot, uh, for example, plot HTML on it. And then, I don't know, uh, if we go to the right folder here. Um, yeah, so we'll just move this here. So now a new file called plot HTML popped up in our folder here. And we can open this with Firefox because it's just an HTML file. And this just contains the plot that we created there. And okay, this is not so impressive right now, but if you just have a more complex plot and interaction with it, this will all be embedded in this HTML file. So you could basically send this HTML file to anyone and they would have uh, the interactions and the data embedded as it is embedded there, they would have it all available. And what you can also do if you want to export your charts, you have those this uh, uh, context menu here where you can see already save as SVG, save as PNG. So you can just click this and say, yeah, I want to save this file. And this will just save it uh, so we can embed it also in one of your, yeah, in any kind of document. And what I also want to show is so you get an idea of this uh, Vega thing that analyzes that you can also open the stuff in the Vega editor right away and then you will see the underlying JSON specification that uh, actually is used to create those charts. So we see that we have, this is like how JSON looks, you have a configuration and then you have here already hconcat stacked and then you have those two unit specifications where you have corresponding to what you have in Python, you have mark, map to point encoding stuff like this condition here so and this is how it looks and you could now also go around here and edit stuff if for some reason uh, it doesn't work out in Python as you expected and the plot would then automatically update here. Yeah so I don't know if we have enough time to go into Voyager probably not so maybe we just do this next time and yeah so next time we will then introduce Voyager a bit, which is like a user interface that uh, is built on top of Vega Lite that allows you to easily create and very like and fast, also very fastly create uh, plots and specification and explore your data set in a very convenient way. So with this, I probably just like give a short hint on our new Jupyter Hub uh, thing. always wanted to do but never found uh, the time for is that uh, we would give you like a standardized environment where you can do your homework and your task and you're not dependent on your own operating system and uh, frustration with uh, installation stuff. So we now finally set up a so-called Jupyter Hub instance and uh, what this is now you have now on a remote server uh, we have uh, Jupyter, yeah, we have this so-called Jupyter Hub instance where you can just log in and have now your own space where you have your uh, Jupyter Lab and where you can also just do anything you are used to. So you can, uh, by default, the lectures repository is installed, so you could open this here and uh, you could execute, for example, the stuff. So all the necessary dependencies for most of the lectures that uh, were recent should be installed. 
maybe not for the experiment stuff because it's a little bit difficult, but so this just works now as uh, expected. And for example, what you could do for your homework is you can just uh, open a terminal and here you can do anything that you do in your terminal at home. So you can just do git clone, whatever, and stuff like this. So you can execute commands here. And uh, yeah, when you go here first, you are asked to sign in with your GitHub credentials. So you are redirected to GitHub, you sign in, then you have your space here. and yeah, then you can do your homework and you can log in later and the state should be saved. So it's not like binder where once like the kernel is dead, everything is lost, but you can go there anytime and continue. However, uh, I'm as like this is the first time that we do this, so we don't really have much experience of how well this works or what possible fit pitfalls might be. So I would at least suggest that you push your changes before you leave the system. Uh, so you don't find bad surprises when you're done like 90% of your homework and then the system explodes for some reason. Um, yeah, so we would be happy if you could try this out. So because you also want to use this for the final exam that you do this here in this environment and uh, like uh, not dependent on your own environment. And so if there are any errors or miscon misconfigurations yet, we would like to find them out early. So if you find any time or want to do the current homework, would we would be happy if you could try it out in this uh, system. Yeah, okay, so that's it for today. And then, yeah, I think next time I will just continue with the rest, uh, really small left that is left, and then uh, homework uh, stuff, and yeah, I think that's it. Okay.